And they've got inflation. And the only thing they can really do is to put the interest rate up. And as we know, given public debt ratios at the level they are, this is going to be expansionary and they're just going to add more interest income and then ceteris paribus, we might expect that to be inflationary. So then obviously they're going to put the interest rate up again, inflation's going to rise. You know, it seems obvious to me that the interest rate hikes for a whole manner of reasons are absolutely the wrong policy. My favourite is when they try to justify it by saying, well, inflation is hurting the working classes, it's hurting the poorest, so what we need to do is make them lose their jobs, then they'll be happier. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic, isn't it? I know your foot was hurting, but don't worry about it, we chopped it off now. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we are delighted to be joined today once again by our friend, economist and author, Dr. Phil Armstrong. Thanks for joining us today, Phil. Always a pleasure to be with you both. So the Bank of England last week just gave us all a nice big half point interest rate hike. (laughs) What do you make of that, Phil? Uh, Well, where to start? I mean, obviously, I I was talking to a a friend of mine who teaches engineering and he was on about the old one club golf, you know, which is something which has been talked about many times. They're on the golf course and they've got one club. And basically, they just, whenever there's a problem, they just got to get that club out and hit it just like no matter where the ball is on the golf course you're just going to get that one club up and wallop it and they've got inflation and the only thing they can really do is to put the interest rate up and as we know given public debt ratios at the level they are this is going to be expansionary and they're just going to add more interest income and then ceteris paribus which is a nice phrase we might expect that to be inflationary so then Obviously, they're going to put the interest rate up again, inflation's going to rise, unless something happens in the rest of the economy to, if you like, more than counteract that, and then they can say that interest rate rise has actually worked. Although, I think I was talking to Warren, this could go a long way, because I think the Argentinians have really been playing hard with that golf. And I think, isn't it something like they've kept on raising the interest rates to reduce inflation? And isn't inflation something like... 80 or 90 percent and the interest rates also gone up to 80 or 90 percent so if your listeners are thinking how far will it go it could go a long way yet unfortunately using the golf metaphor is it fair to say yeah it's they're using the one club but this time they hit it twice as hard because the pundits and most economists the consensus was they would go 25 basis points but they went 50 yeah I had a mate of mine I used to play golf with, and he was a better golfer than me, which is not saying much because I could find water from any range, even if it was behind <laughs> the tee. But what he did was, a friend of mine, I call him John Tonks, he's retired. We were on the tee, and he hit the ball really hard and really well, but he hit it at an angle, and he hit it so hard he hit a tree trunk right in the middle with a resonant wallop, and it went backwards, and he finished 
well behind the tee. <laughs> now, in a way, that's kind of what they're doing. They are hitting the ball harder, but they just hit a tree trunk so hard that it'll just make inflation get worse. Ending up <laughs> further behind them when they start to be. So the next time they did harder still, they're going to hit an even bigger tree. So we could carry on all manner of analogies, but they're doing the wrong thing harder, which is likely to make the problem worse faster. But this time it will work, Phil. That's the whole point. This time it will work. Well, this time hitting the tree trunk in the middle might just so out. <laughs> Maybe the tree trunk will kind of Park slightly to let Johnny Tonks' drive go all the way through. I doubt it. Whatever happens, they'll blame the tree, obviously. But yeah, um, the tree the shouldn't <laughs> be there. You know, I don't yeah, know. It's only been the there model. like three hundred years. It's a big. You didn't old. hit it hard enough. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> but but there's something going on here where see what you guys think about this. But we talk about the interest income channel. So now the government has a net pair of interest. And interest rates have gone up. So payments from government to the non-government. That's us. Those payments have increased. So working that through logically, you would expect that to have an inflationary bias. There's this other thing that central banks do that maybe the last time we spoke to L. Randall Ray, him and Stephanie Keltman written an article about this. And it's their expectations theory that basically the press and mainstream economists have been goading central bankers for <laughs> months now going, you know, you guys were too late to hike and you were too soft. And look, here we are now. And so it's almost like they're going, okay, well, yeah, we'll show you guys who's boss. You know, we're going to go double what you thought we were going to do. And the expectation, therefore, will be the idea of the market will basically see that and think, oh, that now they're serious about <laughs> bringing down inflation. Let's make inflation come down, <laughs> right? That's the expectations theory aspect of it, isn't it? And, you know, do you think that's what's going on? They're trying to send a signal. Could be. I mean, maybe they expect that the expectations are that the tree will disappear. So if you think hard enough about it, you can hit the ball so hard that the tree will disappear or work. <laughs> now, I'm not entirely convinced by the expectation theory. I mean, at the end of the day, the problem with that is if they've been putting interest rates up and people have been seeing it hasn't done anything, on the other hand, well, they haven't done it hard enough, now it's going to work. But given that they've done it a bit and it's done nothing, two nothings is still nothing. I, <laughs> I see that might, I mean... Given they're all a bit crazy, I mean, I think your logic, you've looked into their minds and it, it's a bit of a mess in there, but I think your analysis of the mess is pretty accurate. They may well have said, okay, let's really go for it. I mean, they have to believe this stuff works, otherwise they've got to go, look, our job is meaningless. I don't even know why yeah. you're paying the six-figure <laughs> yeah. salary, right? Yes. I mean, there is a lot of that. What can Andrew Bailey do? I mean, we've mentioned it kind of a few times. He can't really come out and go, look, Inflation will not be reduced by raising interest rates given public debt levels as a percentage of GDP. And what have we seen? Inflation, core inflation's gone up. You know? Yeah, so really there's nothing we can do. All we can really do is put interest rates back to zero and then hope for world conditions to improve so that inflation will disappear with its own accord. And by the way, this MNT thing, we needed a job guarantee to act as a price anchor. So I'm on the phone to Warren as we speak, and he's on his way to England to save the day. Now, that's what he should do, but we all know, I mean, he got like a 500 grand salary or something, it was in the papers. He's going to sort of say, look, serious, we're all going to have to tighten our belts, brackets, accept him. The interest rates are going to go up, and if we do it hard enough for long enough, it will work. And they're just hoping for something else in the world to happen to reduce inflation. You know, maybe the little peace will break out around the world, and there'll be a, a reduction in all the primary product prices. Something like that might happen. I mean, I don't think so. Without being too gloomy, I can't see how inflation is going to disappear in the immediate term. And what they're doing is going to make it worse, not better, you know? Yeah, I think it's quite challenging to have a clear idea of where we're going to end up. And I think that's with rising interest rates or we're moving interest rates because there's so many channels <laughs> that get disrupted. And of course, 
Warren talks about what he believes to be the main one, particularly in the US. I don't know if here, I suspect here it might be the same case, but I don't know for sure, given that so many of the UK bonds are indexed to inflation already. That is still an interesting come channel, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If on the technical front, P, you know, I know it's understandable for people to think that rate hikes take money out of the economy and cool off inflation if you don't think about it too hard because, yeah, people have less to spend on what they'd like to spend on because, but that, that's because they're paying more on interest and that money doesn't evaporate, you know, so where does it go? Yeah. So even Warren said, okay, you know, you are putting more money into the economy through the interest rate channel, but also there is a distribution effect, right? It's a very non-progressive way of doing things. You're given, you know, most of this money is going to the rich. And if anything, the, the ordinary people are being worse off by increased interest payments. It's a wealth transfer thing. And the overall effect might be that, as he says, that you have more spending and you actually don't do anything for inflation overall and, and not even for unemployment or, you know, or not even for house prices. You might end up because the rich need somewhere to put their money, they're getting more money. So house prices may actually not fall for as much as you'd expect, or they might even increase. But at the same time that that's happening, you're having the distribution effect. And I think we discussed it very briefly with him last time, but are there any aspects of that distribution effect that could cause instability? And I guess it's, it's about repayments on loans. And for this to carry on, people still need to be able to meet their loans, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me like, I mean, Warren talks about this tipping point idea that, you know, you've got this sense that if you put interest rates up, then borrowers are giving more money in their interest and they've got less to spend. And they'll cut down on their spending more than the savers will increase theirs because you're giving them more interest income. They're more likely to save. So in a world with no government debt, theoretically at least, these differences in the so-called marginal propensity to consume theoretically would make an interest rate rise in general contractionary but we have passed well warren's view and i tend to again we're well past that point so we're at a point where that effect is kind of swamped by the huge influx of interest rate income that's going in even if rich people have got a lower npc they're still gonna spend quite a lot and certainly when he is he say if you look at the data you can see you know the economy's growing it isn't gone into recession so the distributional effect is extremely regressive, though, because you are putting a lot of strain on borrowers like people who've got mortgages, and some of these people will be feeling a massive pinch, whereas the people who've, if you like, net savers are going to get net sort of the winners and losers, and it is destabilizing. I think Warren says himself it's probably the most aggressive way of spending more money in the economy because it's essentially deficit spending on a massive scale in the most regressive way possible, giving the rich loads more money while taking money, the opposite of Robin Hood, a negative Robin Hood, steal from the poor, give to the rich. And maybe, I mean, without being too cynical, if we think about why the rich banking classes support interest rates, I mean, if you're cynical, they support it because it does that. Or maybe they just instinctively know they've got a lot of money. And in times of inflation, they would obviously favor higher interest rates because they're aware that inflation reduces the real value of their savings. Many of them will be net creditors. They will simply want to protect their position. I mean, it's kind of natural for these guys anyway to do that. So... I think it's an instinctive response, as well as maybe when they think about it, they think, yeah, that's a good idea. So to me, distributionally, I think this is probably even more significant than it really is making the situation worse for the people we as a nation should be looking after, making better for people that, well, to be honest, don't need looking after. So if it's not too much trouble while we're talking about the people that gain and the people that lose out of this... Can you just outline how Bank of England base rate rises translate into higher interest rates for mortgage holders? What's the channel there? Well, banks 
would source their funds. So, like, I'm not a banking expert, but if you imagine, as Warren has said and another banking experts on the podcast, banks will make loans without prior reserves. So, loans create deposits and reserves. So, obviously, the credit worthy customer arrives at the bank, then a loan will be given. And obviously, banks would have to source the reserves if they didn't have any later as a loan. It would be booked as a loan from the central bank. So obviously, if the funds that banks are actually using to, if you like, fund their loans, if they've gone up in price, that will be translated to higher interest rates. So at the end of the day, this is, if you like, the cost of bank funds ultimately has been raised once you put the base rate up. And it'll have a knock-on effect through the system. It isn't quite as smooth as I make out, but basically it's costing the banks more if they're borrowing from the central bank. And obviously now they've put the interest rate up and they're on, the, on reserves as well in the banks are storing reserves. They're getting a lot of money on the reserves that are parked as excess reserves. So in order to make loans, you know, they're going to have to charge more than that. Aren't they too? Otherwise, why bother? Just leave your reserves overnight. You know, why bother making loans? So at the end of the day, through all the interconnection, the most fundamental rate, the base rate goes up, there'll be a knock-on effect through the system, which will tend to raise interest rates for savers and borrowers. Right. So I just saw the news thing on that there has been no change to average mortgage rate for two-year fixed deals. And then some mortgage rates for five-year fixed deals. And obviously, the further away you go in that, it lowers to 5.83 and 5.82. This is an average. And I think that we've seen a much larger gap in the past between the Bank of England rate and mortgage rates. And I get the feeling that banks aren't raising mortgage rates as high because they still feel that in the medium term, the bank is going to have to reduce interest rates. You know, recession is going to come and and they're going to have to lower interest rates. Well, maybe there's a lot of competition. I mean, banks have to compete to make loans. So if fewer people are making loans, then maybe, I mean, again, you always wish you hadn't Warren to give you the details because he'd just laugh and give you the answer. But it seems to me that if there's a reduction in, you know, the amount of people who feel they can afford to get mortgages, the bank's going to have to compete with them. We're in a position where the banks are holding excess reserves collectively, which will have an effect on is they've got the reserves rather than, you know, in the old days when there wouldn't be a, a system-wide excess of reserves in the system. So it may be that mortgages haven't actually gone up as much as they otherwise would have done. I mean, I haven't got the data in front of me, but it'd be interesting to know how much they have gone up from the interest rate on mortgages has gone up from when the Bank of England started changing interest rates. I don't know if you've got that data. Yeah, it says in October 2021, the average rate on a five-year deal was 2.55%. And this is when the Bank of England was at, what, 0.5%? Yeah, so there was a 2% difference. Whereas now the same deal is 5.83%. So it's reduced the gap. (laughs) Yeah, the net interest margin has gone down, hasn't it? So they're obviously making a lower margin on their loans than they were. And that may be due to several factors. Not being a bank expert, I can't tell you exactly why that would be doing that. We can apply a bit of logic, can't we, that in the money markets, if the risk-free rate on a two-year gilt, right, that's the lowest you could possibly borrow for, right? <laughs> if that's 6%, then a bank is going to charge something above that, right? There's no way around that. So to me, I think that's the channel that it works through, you know, and then you obviously you can do all this analysis where you go, well, this was the average rate there, uh, average mortgage rate being achieved at this policy rate. And this was the average mortgage rate being achieved at this policy rate. It hasn't quite gone up yet, but all the headlines are saying, no, 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 there's a mortgage crisis going on. People can't afford to pay their mortgages because their interest rate deals have just changed, you know, and the people who are coming to the ends of their fixed term mortgages having to buy new ones and the new ones they can't afford them 
so they've definitely gone up. Yes. I was talking to a mate of mine yesterday about the same thing. He was saying how his mortgage has gone up significantly, like it was 150, now it's like 500 or something. It's a significant jump. So you can kind of debate, in a way, the technicalities of the base rate's gone up and mortgages have also gone up. There's maybe a change in the net interest margin for various factors that a real expert would look at. But in terms of the fundamentals, as you say, they do tend to go in line, not linear, and banking's complicated levels of competition and other things, different sources that they can get reserves from, et cetera, or funding sources. But nevertheless, the key point, I think, is mortgages are getting more expensive and when interest rates go up, it is like, as Patricia was saying, this redistributional effect from borrowers towards savers. And so it seems to me a totally unprogressive policy to be pursuing. Mm. That's an interesting framing as well that we all talk about it, borrowers and savers, you know, borrowers are losing, the savers are winning. Savers, you kind of think... Savers gives people the idea of like maybe, you know, a, a more senior person putting money away because, you know, they're being sensible and virtuous. And it's really redistributing it between borrowers and creditors, I would say. You know, and those savers that we're thinking about that have been diligently saving money for eventualities like old age and infirmity, you know, they're still not getting the rates that banks are getting as well. You know, that it's, I know that some executives, bank executives have been doing the rounds on the media saying, oh, we're getting there. You know, we're very close. We've got some very good savings accounts, but they've been very slow to put up the savings rates, haven't they? Yeah. There's a sense, isn't there, when, you, like you were saying, when you think of a saver, you you maybe think of a, a little old lady with a bubble cut and grey hair who's put that little bit of money away to help her grandchildren. And we conceptualise the word saver sounds like, as you say, virtuous. But the reality is that it's probably some slick guy who's stashed all his money away or some sort of big corporate entity that is benefited, but not like the little savers inverted commas so it's it is the use of language a lot of the time and yeah the, the saving rates i mean i haven't been following it in detail don't seem necessarily to go up as you'd say at the same pace as the borrowing rates go up. so you know just quoting from a recent piece from the guardian on monetary policy put bluntly pain is a feature not a bug of tackling inflation the whole point of hiking interest rates is, as Jeremy Hunt's economic advisor Karen Ward put it, to create uncertainty and frailty, squeezing consumers until they spend less, making employers clamp down on wages. If it isn't hurting, it isn't working, as John Major famously said once in the 80s. So is there any alternative to this pain <laughs> narrative? <laughs> is there another way we could be helping people? We must hurt you to help you. Well, I think they're giving like mortgage grace periods now. They're proposing some of them. So it's basically Jeremy Hunt and the banks have drawn up a measure that means that UK mortgage holders will now get a 12 month grace period before repossessions if they fall into arrears. Yeah. The interesting thing about that is that it's presented by the media as trying to help families. Whereas one of the justifications of, I think, Keir Starmer's labour in not doing it was that it couldn't be justified because it was working against what the interest rate was trying to do. So, Which was create pain, right? Yeah. So this policy isn't really about helping families. It's simply about hurting families, but doing it in a way that doesn't destabilise the whole financial system. This pain thing is, it's always sold by people, you know, obviously it's television and it's media when it's being sold to you, you know, you're reading in the papers from well-paid columnists and you're looking at sort of talking head pieces on the news, nice warm studios, well-paid pundits. It's almost like the retirement debate when they say, oh, we're going to raise the retirement age. There's always some like well-fed person <laughs> in a studio going, well, look, you know, we're living longer now, so we don't mind working that little bit longer. I'm like, yeah, you don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> Six-figure salary guy, you know, <laughs> they're gesturing to each other. 
further and you know like come on this is common sense what if you've never had it so good you know it's quite and, and again so when they talk about this pain narrative i mean i heard somebody on the radio last week saying when the 50 basis point surprise happened they were kind of you know mock wincing and go yes this is going to be a very hard watch this and it's like yeah that's exactly it you know if you're in that group you're watching it it must be really hard for you guys to just watch this <laughs> you know <laughs> they're not in it they're watching it there's a thing i was talking about with my students about ethics which is a bit of a unusual word isn't it in economics I mean, like, if you went to the doctor and the doctor says, well, I'm going to try some sort of procedure on you. Now, it likely won't work, and it's going to cause you one enormous amount of pain, but I don't care. Now, really, that's what economists do. They're just giving out advice because it's the only advice that they've got at their disposal, and it gives a lot of pain. But when they say, well, isn't there another way? Well, we don't care. We're just telling you what you have to do. The pain doesn't affect us. Well, to me, it's too easy a job. They have to accept the fact and they have to justify whether the pain is worth it. And what I think is quite interesting about the whole inflation thing is even they must know that the inflation didn't come from people being too rich in the first place. I mean, there are one or two like crazy gang monetarists or something, but most ordinary <laughs> people, you, you know, these guys, you know, they haven't realised the gold standard's gone, you know, maybe that's <laughs> yeah. wishful thinking, but let's say about like ordinary people, for want of a better phrase, they all know, you know, we went through the pandemic, we didn't really have any inflation, which is a bit of a surprise, and then we had war, we had post-pandemic supply chain problems, you have had food price rises, gas price, so everybody knows where the inflation came from, who've got any sense at all. So what they're really trying to do is say, well, we've got inflation from all these supply side issues, and the only thing we've got is interest rate rises, which don't really connect. So we're just going to try and make people so poor, so physically so much pain, well, at least for the ones who've got mortgages who aren't very rich. That's our solution to inflation. Well, to me... Is inflation that bad that it needs that solution? The pain is worth more than the cure. Like, in my opinion, all right, okay, let's say we had 8% inflation. You might think, okay, it started from a supply. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. It's supplied from a supply chain issue. Assume you're not one of these lunatic guys. So let's take a longer term view and just accept the fact that until the supply chain issues are resolved or something happens to the benefit, then we're going to get inflation. So, okay, let's not be stupid and put interest rates up because it's going to cause more pain than the inflation itself and make sure we protect the people who are most vulnerable to inflation. You know what I mean? So I know it's a bit of a drastic statement, but like inflation isn't that bad i mean all right we don't want 15 20 percent inflation to last forever but it seems to me the cure inverted commas is worse than the actual thing and it made worse by the fact the cure doesn't even work i mean if it worked and there was a clear direct mechanism that could be specified to show how it worked and has worked in the past so if, going back to my doctor analogy, if the doctor could say, Look, I know this is painful, but trust me, I know it worked, and here's all the data of the past and that shows it works, therefore, do you want to do it? And you would say, okay, but what they're really doing now is I'm going to try something that's never really worked in the past. It's going to be very, very painful, but we're going to do it because it's the only thing we can do. My favourite is when they try to justify it by saying, well, inflation is working, it's hurting the working classes, it's hurting the poorest, so what we need to do is make them lose their jobs so that then they'll be happier. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? I know your foot was hurting, but don't worry about it. We chopped it off now. You know, I mean, come off it. But you know what like I said? We're worried about inflation, so we're going to put VAT up. Well, that means the price has gone up overnight. I mean, you can't script it in a sense because it is so bizarre. You know, I said, okay, the poor are suffering from inflation, so we're going to lose the jobs. Around them. What we're going to do is subsidise things like, travel and energy and food so that people can afford to pay the higher prices. Job done. And we're not going to crash the economy. 
we're not going to make them, you know, so businesses are going to struggle. What about that then? You know, oh, can't do that. And it's like mad. It's insanity on a monumental scale. Without me going off on a rant, it just seems like crazy. I remember in the 70s that, all right, people go on about how bad it was. But if you're in a decent trade union, your wages kept up with inflation and the real value of your mortgage fell and you were doing okay. Obviously, there were people who were on fixed incomes and everything like that who were struggling. But now, obviously, with an MNT understanding, you know, we can actually deal with those sorts of problems. So, you know, it seems obvious to me that, as all your listeners will agree, that the interest rate hikes, for a whole manner of reasons, are absolutely the wrong policy. I think what could cap this off is to channel something that L. Randall Ray said to us a few interviews with him ago. He just said, you know, if you ask any economist, you know, what happens if they put oil prices up, <laughs> that economist will say inflation will go up, prices will go up. And OK, what will happen if wages go up? Oh, yeah, inflation will go up. <laughs> what happens if interest rates go up? Oh, prices will come down, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, so every other cost in the economy, if you raise it, we understand that's going to raise prices. But for some reason, this cost of doing business called interest, when you put that up, somehow they've got this idea that every, oh, that's going to bring everything else down. And so in terms of like turning the corner, former Chancellor John McDonnell had an idea about tackling the mortgage crisis, but unfortunately it's based on the taxes fund spending model, which we don't like as MMT, is John McDonnell suggested that if the UK's big five banks were required to pay a windfall tax of 15%, that could fund a mortgage interest relief scheme. 15% tax on 2023 first quarter profits alone would be £3 billion. What's our problem as MMT is with this framing? The problem with this is that, to me, is that even if we look at it from a perspective of okay, well, you know, we've had a supply side issue and we need to make sure that the resources that we are getting, you know, the energy that we are getting is going to the right people, that those who need it most get it first. And then that presumably we want to curtail on the spending of the rich so that inflation comes down a bit. Even if I look at it from that perspective and I look at John McDonald's tax proposals, his tax proposals tend to be always framed in a way of, oh, we're just going to tax a little bit here and a little bit there in a way that doesn't hurt you very much. And then we'll get all these other benefits. But the point is that if you want to do that, if you want to tell inflation by addressing excessive demand, then we need to hurt the rich. <laughs> and we need to be blatant about hurting them really bad so that the rest of us can have lower prices and better standard of living. But we have to get the windfall tax to, quote unquote, pay for the mortgage interest relief scheme. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to know with John because, I mean, I've not met him. I know Bill's met him. It's difficult to know how much with somebody like him, whether he understands MMT but just don't talk about it. You know, it's like that which cannot be named, you know, where I don't really know that. But obviously the whole idea of it is ridiculous. You know, like we said before, collecting something that you can issue it's quite popular and it rings quite well, I think, with certain members of the left who don't understand it. You know, it's the idea where well, we take money from the rich and then we can use it for laudable purposes. You know, like a big Robin Hood, this time the right way around. So it has a certain appeal. But given that the purpose of tax, as we know, is to free up resources for either the state to buy or in the case of maybe the poor, you could say exactly what Trish said. If we've got to tax the rich so hard that they can't spend as much on real stuff, which is now available for poorer people to buy at existing prices or the state to buy at existing prices. Now, given that we know that the rich have got much lower marginal propensity to consume, you've really got to tax them very hard. Because if you don't tax them very hard, they just keep on spending as much as they were or very close to it, and there won't be many resources left. So to affect their actual demand for goods and services, you would have to tax the rich 
really, really hard. And I think somebody like John McDonald isn't prepared to go there because he's not prepared to deal with, well, I'll leave the country and, and they'll crash the pound and all the sort of neoliberal nonsense that, that comes out over and over again. So in a way, it's avoiding the Cree problem. What he's really saying is, well, okay, well, accept neoliberalism that we need to put interest rates up to deal with inflation, which is the wrong thing to do. We're going to tax the rich, not too hard, we don't upset them, enough to get some money that we can cut in a fund to help the poor, which again is wrong. So both of the reasons behind it, sadly, are both completely and utterly wrong. He's not recognising the state's ability as a monopoly issuer of the currency, as you and your listeners have all know, just to spend according to public purpose. You know, if we're going to tax the rich... We do that for equity purposes, not revenue. So we just want to make sure that their command of real resources is lower than it was. And by redistribution, those most deserving people, if you like, the ones maybe who are working flat out on lower incomes, their incomes will be more able to buy those resources at existing prices. So as a policy, I mean, it may come from the right place. I've not met John. He strikes me as a nice guy, but... I would think in terms of MNT or being based on any real, real deep knowledge of the economy, it's not out of 10, you know. It wouldn't take that many more words in a short article or a short letter to whichever newspaper you're floating this proposal in to just add, OK, we're going to charge the five big banks this windfall tax because they're making too much money <laughs> or even bring in the word offset you know, to offset the spending or something like that. But the tax relief money is there now. We have it. It comes from the same place all government spending comes from. Instead of using a windfall tax to pay for something good, basically is going to delay the action that's urgently needed. Again, it, we should learn from the pandemic when the relief payments were urgently needed they happened like right quick. You know, it wasn't like, well, you know, let's let's raise a bunch of taxes, let's sell a bunch of bonds. It was, well, no, here's the payments they're coming now. So we know that that's where money comes from. <laughs> when you're a currency issuing government, it's typed into existence, as it were. So I don't think it takes too much to just sort of reframe what taxes are functionally doing in a proposal such as John McDonald's. And there's been some good news on that front as well, because I don't know if you saw this, but you know, in terms of how we'd prefer the conversation about taxing to be going, this week, a group in the US called the Patriotic Millionaires put out a piece. Yeah, I saw that article. Yeah, you sent me. Yeah, yeah. The title of the piece was, as they put it, the real reason we want to raise taxes on the rich. And this is rich people speaking, <laughs> like, please tax us more, basically. Did you have any thoughts on that, Phil? I mean, I only just read it today, but it sounded pretty good to me. People recognize that the purpose of tax is obviously to reduce spending power and to free up resources. So obviously, it's got a lot more MMT consistency in it, you know, the purpose of tax. I think one of the guys in the group has a podcast called Pitchfork Economics. That's two guys. And I'm pretty sure they've had Warren on their podcast. And this is going back maybe five years if I off the top of my head. So, yeah, and you read the piece and they've absolutely absorbed it. Yeah, so Warren's influence is coming through. The other thing I always think about the, uh, the John McDonald type thing, and I think we've mentioned before, various points over the years is it really empowers the rich big banks or you know big business because it creates a narrative where like ordinary people one of the better phrase need them we need them to do good things and that means their sort of threats to leave the country where the tax rates are lower it adds credibility to those sorts of suggestions so it's like, you know, if I was a teacher and I knew that I could just mark the students present, but I had this idea that I needed to go next door to borrow the marks or to acquire the marks from my colleague next door, I would immediately have given him a lot of power over me. So he goes, well, if you don't behave yourself, Phil, I ain't giving you those present marks. Now, even if he was a villain, you know, 
I mean, my colleagues are all nice guys. And I could say to my class, look, I've run out of present marks. You all need to be marked here. They go, yeah, yeah, we're getting into trouble for poor attendance. I'm going next door to Mr. X, the hard man. But uh, they go, oh, no, are you? And I say, yeah, and I'll come back. But we wouldn't like him. But we would be empowered. He'd be an important guy. And then I said, what if he leaves the college? And the students go, oh, no, we, well, where are we going to get your smart marks from, Phil? And I go, I don't know. But if I just put feet on the table and go, well, fortunately, I've got the spreadsheet. So we don't need the guy next door. And if he leaves the college, just like I said, I'm not talking about a real person. I love my college college. Then we ain't bothered because I can always mark you here. And that's why, in a fundamental sense, these guys are making a really bad mistake because they're playing right into the hands. I know it goes down well, tax the rich to pay for the poor. You'll get people like Alan Sugar and these guys saying, that, watch out, I'll leave the money and I'll take my two and a half million tax or whatever is with me and then you won't be able to afford another hospital. And it's just such a massive own goal that, I mean, it all, it needs to be sort of stopped at source. They're making the situation worse. You know, you tax the rich because they got too much money. They're buying too many real resources that could be used more valuably or to, for other reasons. And that's the thing that really kind of is sometimes, I don't, maybe understressed. You play it into their hands, you know? Also, it's a false threat. It's a false threat. I mean, aside from the fact that we don't need them, the rich are probably the least mobile people in the world. You know, the, the amount of property they have here, you know, they can't just drop it one day and move elsewhere. They are pretty much attached. <laughs> yeah. I just like to call a bluff. Look them in yeah. the eye and go, we don't need you, but need is us. If you don't want to stay in Britain. Go on, don't come back. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> yeah, on the way out. Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. <laughs> hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener. And we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. And like it sounds like harsh, but running a business is like a privilege. And, you know, if you can meet the rules, you know, the, the rules of God's environment, caring for people. Then great, you know, run a business, make profits for yourself. But it's our sandpit, and if you want to play in it, abide by our rules. You can't set the rules. If you try and set the rules, your history, you know, normal people can't set the rules. You know, you don't go to your employer and set the rules and say, well, I'll come in on Monday, but I won't come in in the afternoon, and I want to go on holiday these times, and I insist you give me a lot more than you give everybody else. You say, uh, you're sacked. You know? So it's like just abiding by the democratically set rules and things like that just turn everything on its head and make it as though these guys are more important than they actually are they're not you know that's why i think it gives me a bit of hope to see that there's a, a group i don't know how big they are these the patriotic millionaires group who will put out a piece like this and highlighted in the piece is this one sentence we believe we need to raise taxes on the rich to reduce inequality. Doesn't take much. That's only a few words. You can put that in your <laughs> piece about raising taxes. 
because there's a mortgage crisis and just put that in there to say that's why we're raising taxes the money to pay for the nice thing that we're doing which is you know stopping people becoming homeless that already exists we can make that exist you know we spend money into existence where we deem it necessary but we believe we need to raise taxes on this activity and this activity and this activity because we want to disincentivize it and we also want to raise taxes to reduce inequality you know it's not so hard to say no it absolutely makes sense it's great to read it actually chris yeah it really gave me a little bit of a boost you know i i thought oh that's all right there are good things going on you know? <laughs> yeah because yeah. you can get a bit pessimistic sometimes yeah you know yeah. i mean We've all been there, you know, you think, oh, oh, well, I mean, I remember as far back as the early 2010s reading David Graeber in The Guardian talking about where money comes from, you know, money's an IOU, and they, he was basically doing a write-up of the Bank of England paper, I think the 2013 Bank of England paper. I think the title of the piece was The Cat's Out of the Bag, you know, money's an IOU. And me thinking, well, this is the year everything changes for sure. You know, uh, you know, there was still a lot of activist energy coming from Occupy Wall Street and Occupy London Stock Exchange and places like that. But it doesn't matter how many times you say it and people kind of learn the lesson. But then, like we observe, they go, yeah, 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 we know all this. Yeah, we know that money is accounting and money is credit and it's a construct and it's infinite but they'll go and try and fold that into their loanable funds theory <laughs> do you know what i mean or do you know something that's just completely <laughs> doesn't work anymore yeah and i was thinking a little bit about this monetary industry and skill stuff why does it keep coming back you know like the monetarists so like you know like there's a game you used to play at the fair called frogger i don't know if you ever heard of it what happens is that you get like i don't know it's years ago i mean you, you pay a pound or something and what happens is that there's these little wooden frogs and they jump up and you hit them with a mallet. So they're only wooden, you know, I'm a member of the RSVB. And then the faster the frogs come up and you say how far you can go before, and if a frog stays up too long before you hit it with the mallet, you see. So the frog comes up, you knock it down. Then a little, the wooden thing, little wooden from you hit down that. Then it goes on the, and two or three come up at once and you see how far you can go. Well, that's the thing with like the monetarists. They're like these little frogs that as soon as, you know, you knock them down and then as soon as any inflation, they all come back. The mallets are out so fast. They're all out there, you know, like someone's increased the money supply. <laughs> we started off with golf clubs and now it's like croquet mallets. <laughs> We're taking croquet mallets to monetarists. Yeah, boom. Yeah, well, I'm, I wouldn't <laughs> strike a monetarist. I mean, I try to think, well, how does it happen? I don't know. I haven't met all of them, you know, maybe... <laughs> Some of them are all right. You know, they, I mean, they're a bit deluded, but I mean, some of them are just like a bit answer nice. You know, they're a mixed crop, you know, these little wooden frogs that are leaping out, you know. I'm showing my age, you know, if any of your listeners might remember this, it's a fairground game, you know. I don't know how, how, whether, how long it lasted, but I just remember laughing at a few of my mates trying it in the, I think it would be the 70s or 80s, you know. But I think what they do is, they mix up what possibly what is and what, in their opinion, ought to be. So they think like the world ought to be a world like the gold standard world where banks were actually just intermediaries. So they were just taking money from people and lending it out. They couldn't create money. The central bank, maybe like under a gold standard, was actually in charge of how much money there was and therefore you know because the money supply is not endogenous it is actually controlled in their world by the central bank in this crazy world then just maybe their ideas might have some traction you know so on their mv it was pt for any people who've done a level economics you know the money supply is controlled so if you imagine that's how they want the world to be and they forget that that isn't what it's actually like. I mean, I'm not saying I want to be the world. So what I'll say is, well, when you got inflation, that's the central bank's fault for quote unquote printing too much money. The government spending too much, which wasn't quote unquote funded by taxes and borrowing. So from their world, 
their imaginary world the way the world ought to be for them. But then they translate that into the real world. And that's a big, big problem because, as we know, the money supply is endogenous and the central bank can't control the money supply and the money supply expands in relation to and as an effect of rising nominal income or aka the price level so if i'm being generous it's and you can't ever break them out of that because they're so deeply embedded in this if you like individualist ethics and they can't get out of it they're trapped in a world they always say that the money supply going up caused prices to rise whereas in reality prices rise and the money supply expands in line as it has to do otherwise you can't you know as we've said before people can't operate at that price level but nevertheless it's not the cause it's just something that happens if i decide i want to drive i don't know to the center of york now i need more fuel but the fuel consumption although necessary wasn't what caused me to do it and i said oh i want to use fuel I'm going for a purpose. I don't know how, whether that other people have thought of this way of thinking before, but it just sort of came to me in a flash of possible inspiration or not. This confusing is and ought. But MMT is trying to describe the world as it is. These guys think they're doing that, but they're describing an imaginary world. And at most generous, you know, some of the went out into the gold standard. Back on the conservative side of things, speaking of being realistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George George Osborne last week, who's giving evidence to the COVID-19 inquiry, and he's still maintaining that austerity wasn't ideological, but an economic necessity. And uh, in his words, back in the day, essential to rebuild fiscal space to provide scope to respond to future economic shocks, <laughs> which did come along. Some may posit that the economic shocks were caused by the austerity. But, you know, Patricia, how would you say George Osborne's idea to build fiscal space by starving the economy of investment worked out in the end? Well, he's not even an economist, is he? But he's using words like rebuild fiscal space. I mean, he must be clever, right? <laughs> no. So... Obviously, fiscal space is about the resources that you have available to purchase at any one time and not utilizing resources now. Every generation uses the resources that it has available at its disposal and the most important of which is, of course, employment. So if you don't use those resources now, if you make people unemployed now, it doesn't mean you are better prepared to employ them in the future. It, it doesn't make them available to be employed in the future. It just doesn't work that way. You must use the resources that you have available now. And what the fiscal space that he's, of course, talking about is about money, is about the fiscal balance, the taxation and spending. And in his erroneous belief that to make fiscal space, you know, that a government can go broke and that it therefore needs to save some money through taxation or reduce its debts, either through taxation or austerity, in order to then be able to borrow more in future, which of course is, is a nonsense because nobody is ever going to say no <laughs> to a government bond and the government doesn't need to issue bonds in the first place to fund its spending. So, yeah, it makes no sense. It already feels quite old now hearing him say that again. Hopefully, well, I'm not putting my hopes up, but I hope one day he wakes up <laughs> and he realizes, oh God, it was all for nothing. Just being real about, you know, what money is. I often like to say this, so sorry if you're listening and you've heard this before, but if you write IOU five pounds on a piece of paper and give it to yourself, right? <laughs> what you've got is a five pound liability and a five pound asset, right? <laughs> AKA nothing. <laughs> okay. This is the position the government is in when it collects its IOUs back from you in tax revenue. It can't save for a rainy day. <laughs> the assets and the liabilities cancel out. You know, and that's why we say, that when the tax revenue comes back to the government, bear in mind we're saying it comes back, you know, it didn't originate in the private sector and then we're collecting it. It's like it's been issued by the government. It goes out into the non-government sector, 
does its thing, comes back to the government in tax revenue. When it comes back, it's effectively deleted out of existence. You know, I think we need to focus on that. So the idea that, okay, well, we're having a good time now, or no, we're having a bad time now, so we really need to save, (laughs) right? We need to take more money out of the economy so that we'll have it for when we need to spend it in the future. For a currency issuing government to do that, it literally can't do that. And just the stats on what happened in those years, I was reading in the paper, the number of children in poverty rose following his austerity policies, George Osborne's austerity policies, to 4.2 million by last year, caused by his benefit cuts that stripped 37 billion, mostly from families with children, 37 billion pounds, two child limits, keeping an extra 250,000 children below the poverty line, you know, cuts to universal credit. The Child Poverty Action Group survey showed how heavily the cost of living crisis weighs on children even among families that are not technically poor more than two-thirds of parents 67 percent say their children have too many money worries to be able to enjoy their childhood affecting their mental health their physical health children express deep anxieties about their family's lack of money And the report says that the minimum immediate need is free school meals and a return of the £20 a week taken from universal credit. But response to the latest inflation figures focuses less on this than on this mortgage time bomb (laughs) that everybody's talking about. But like I say, it's all built on this myth that a government that issues its own currency can even save its own money. You know, that thing I was talking about my college thing, you know, with the mark. I could say to my class, couldn't I? Now, look, I know if I don't mark you in, you're going to get kicked out of college for poor attendance, and then you'll have the sort of the consequences for life. But I'm kind of worried that I might not be able to get enough present marks from this mean guy next door. So I'm thinking about next year. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm not able. I can't afford now to mark you present. And the students will say, oh, well, you've got to mark us here because we get kicked out. And I go, no, I've run out and I, I don't think I'm going to get enough. So some of you, sadly, will have to leave the college and you're going to have to lose your education because I dared press the keys, you know. I haven't got enough. But you'll all benefit later because in a few years' time, even though you've been really poor, by then I will have rebuilt my marking space. <laughs> you know, that, you know, there would be great prosperity in the college so you can come back. And they would look at me, wouldn't they, and think, you're dangerously mad. And particularly <laughs> if, like, 15 years later, I was interviewed on the radio and then tried to justify why I'd done it. I mean, the best thing, George Osborne really needs to be quiet. I mean, mm. he is a terrible, terrible economist. And He's not an economist. All right, OK. <laughs> well, you said that was such... Power and, and feeling. <laughs> I'm going to definitely agree with it. He's a terrible non economist and the worst <laughs> chancellor, and there's been some bad ones. I think the University of Manchester gave him an honorary degree afterwards, uh, which <laughs> I thought was horrific that a university. Non economics. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. There's a, a program I listen to sometimes on Double Down News called Not the Andrew Marr Show. Oh, yeah. He could have a PhD in not economics. (laughs) You know, that would be quite good, wouldn't it? (laughs) Like, the antithesis of understanding economics, like crazyville economics. Yeah, it is phenomenally how bad the crazy thinking was in that era. And the fact that it may kind of return in some form or other, and, like, people just don't learn, which is another interesting question why, Something was so discredited, such an unmitigated failure. People give this guy a platform. It's like beyond crazy. As for getting a degree, well, it just makes me laugh. It's so ridiculous. But anyway. So, yeah, not to drill too much further down into the negativity, but also, so on the other side of the aisle, Keir Starmer last week gave a speech laying out Labour's green agenda. But he took the opportunity to underscore what he's calling Labour's iron fiscal rules. Here's a quote. 
day-to-day spending will be completely covered by the taxes we collect and we will get debt as a share of the economy falling by the end of next parliament. These are iron rules and we must accept the consequences because if we lose control of the economy, it's working people who pay the price. Now, will these rules protect or God forbid even empower working people as you see it? Well, this is the legacy of McDonnell and his advisors, isn't it? I mean, it, the rule may not be exactly the way that he proposed it, but for sure it's inspired by it. And this idea that, you know, you must put a rule on top of your fiscal spending that must come above the economic needs of your country. You must respect the rule before you provide employment. You must respect the rule before you feed the hungry or you provide housing. The rule comes first. That is really bad politics in my view. And really what we're asking or, we, you know, what we're demanding, I guess, is saying that we can replace these rules with better automatic stabilizers, right? You know, that the rules should be full employment, you know, deliver the government deficit that will deliver full employment. Let the deficit float around a real outcome rather than having a, an arbitrary goal like you know as long as debt is, as a share of gdp is falling that's our rule like, who cares who cares if debt is as yeah, a share of yeah. gdp newspaper falling. headlines care and you know and that's the problem i think that's what we're fighting against isn't it lots of conditioning in media i guess yeah i mean it's sad that they thought that gave them more credibility well it didn't all it did was give the next government the sort of their regressive rules that he gave credibility to Keir Stammer's government so it worked the other way around, and I think it's backfired massively, but not that they'll admit to that, of course. Oh, I mean, it's nice to see him pushing back a little bit within Labour on some of the things that Rachel Reeves has said, but I don't think they get into it like directly, you know, having a falling out publicly or anything like that, but like, you know, in parallel, I think, to what she's proposing in terms of like, well, I mean, for instance, the week before last, Rachel Reeves said she was going to delay spending plans for a green transition if Labour won the next election. And then that triggered some reaction about the urgency of a green transition and how to quote unquote pay for it. Colin Hines, the co-founder of the Green New Deal group in the UK, proposed that an estimated £55 billion a year of tax breaks for pension savers could be redesigned to support employment creating investment with social and environmental goals. He also suggested that the government could use some of the £70 billion a year saved in tax-free ICES, higher taxes on the wealthy, etc., to pay for a Green New Deal. And then after that, any shortfall can be paid for with quantitative easing. Again, you know, what's our reaction to that? The idea that it all has to be offset with something like quantitative easing or money that's been saved in ICES or, you know, we've already been through the, here's why you want to tax and here's why you want to put higher taxes on the wealthy. You know, we need to reduce inequality. Nearly everybody can see that, like the, you know, the, like a more equitable society is just going to be way more productive. We're going to waste way less money on patching up the toxic effects of having inequality. But isn't saying we're going to use QE to fund this, isn't that just a more politically acceptable way of saying this will go unfunded? I mean, at the moment, the rules are that the UK government, that the Treasury has to issue bonds and, you know, the way it works at the moment, there is a roundabout way where you have to issue bonds and then the central bank has to buy them back <laughs> rather than just because of the whole bank independence thing. That's the way it works at the moment. Of course, the rules could be changed and you could just say, well, just don't issue the bonds in the first place, you know. But at the moment, I think that's not allowed. There would have to be a rule change. I'm trying to work out, I've not heard this, how you can fund something with QE. QE as your listeners know, it's just like when the central bank buys previously issued bonds from banks and financial institutions. So when they say they're going to fund it, I mean, do they mean that I'm trying to make something up as I go along? Is it like, okay, they're going to assume that some organisations that may have got government bonds may be then involved in a Green New Deal or something can then sell their bonds to the Bank of England and use the money that they get from the Bank of England to buy things from... I mean, I'm struggling to work out the... Or is there going to be some sort of 
green bank are they inventing a green bank and they're going to give it some bonds and then buy the bonds off it because qe's i can't work out unless they're, they're meaning qe in a different way how can qe be a funding source it's giving a bit of a headache to work out how you can use qe to fund something i think it comes from a time when we know that in the wake of the great financial crisis, and most people know that the banks did this thing called quantitative easing, and that got translated as, oh, the banks are printing money, right? <laughs> the central bank is printing money and giving it to banks. And that became what quantitative easing was in the minds of a lot of people. So then that brought about this idea of, well, we could have people's quantitative easing. You know, if you're going to do it for the banks, you're going to print money for the banks, you can print money for the people. And that got a lot of traction for a while, I think. So it's kind of stayed in the public consciousness as like, oh, QE equals money printing. So is it just a way of saying we might just give them some money that the Bank of England's just, like the government's just going to key into existence or the Bank of England's going to key into existence just for the purpose and they're calling it QE just because it sounds good. Yeah, I think so. I think it just sounds a little bit more technical than just, well, you know, when the government spends... We're just not going to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's probably more likely. Yeah, We don't do it because it will be inflationary. Just for anybody new here, though, what we're saying and what's been proven in countries with money systems like the UK, the US, Japan, Canada, Australia, etc., is that the government does only spend one way <laughs> by money creation. All government spending creates new money, new purchasing power. So it doesn't come from anywhere. So, Phil, before we wrap up, and I'm really putting you on the spot now, <laughs> but what can we as regular people do if we want to stop being collateral damage, cannon fodder in this war on inflation that these generals at central banks seem to have absolutely no idea how to fight? What do I recommend as a policy or both? What, what do you recommend as policy and how do we get there? You know, how do we even get it on the agenda? Now, that is a tricky one. I mean, I think the sort of consensus of what's needed is completely the wrong way around. And, and as you know, with people like Keir Starmer's sort of new neoliberal Labour, I mean, I, and Rachel Reeves, you mentioned, who's like to me, and I, I was talking to a friend of mine saying she's be a great Tory chancellor. <laughs> she's tough. Works to the Bank of England, you know, no messing, you know, she'd be ideal. Whereas somebody like Jeremy Hunt seems a little bit lame somehow. She'd be ideal. She'd be a darling of the Tories, you know. I could just see her and Penny Morden, you know, carrying a sword each, you know, down somewhere or other, you know, who's going to be tougher on the working classes and who's going to be tougher on the unemployed. And be hard work, wouldn't it? But maybe they might try and poach her. You know, like the Saudi Arabians have been trying to buy all the footballs and wait for the Tories <laughs> to put in a big bid for Rachel Reeves. Money, no object. <laughs> being serious about inflation, I mean, it's very difficult because everyone's digging while we try to fill the hole in. You know, so I think personally, we've got to keep putting as much information out there to show the idea that higher interest rates actually make the situation worse you know so i think warren's right on the money on that and i think you know warren's example of argentina where the interest rate keeps going up and the inflation rate keeps going up so the interest rate keeps going up i mean that's essentially how long will it last you know i remember toy story when my kids were young was how low will you go you know when they were going to a playing in the factory this is how high will you go? So in other words, keep the interest rate up, inflation goes up. The interest rate up, inflation goes up. I mean, how long are you going to do it for? So I think we've got to really push that because it's not going to work. And the usual stuff, we've got to kind of be very strong on the job guarantee as a buffer stock, as a, a major way of being an inflation anchor. And also this idea that I think is very important with inflation, we have to have a cure that's actually less painful than inflation itself i was i was on a podcast with like a very nice guy in america who's quite right wing but he's affable and he was saying oh well all the free money the american people got in covid that's what caused the inflation is free money and i was saying to him well i don't agree with that but let's say you were right what would the alternative be would you say to people look 
You're going to all go out and get COVID because we're not going to give you any money because it might be inflationary. Or you're going to starve because you don't go out and get COVID because you are compromised with your immune system. So you're either going to die or get COVID and live. And we're not going to spend any money on you because we might get a bit of inflation. Is that really what you're saying? And that made him think because this idea that giving people money in extremists might be inflationary because they've got money to spend now and they're going to go and spend it in the shops and it might cause inflation. So we're just going to let people starve to avoid inflation. What? So I think we have to be very strong on the idea, although inflation's bad, it isn't the worst possible thing. And also the government is the currency issuer. So therefore, if it wants to deal with things, it can do that. Like, you know, the German government that, okay, we've got prices going up, so we're going to let people travel very freely. We're going to subsidize things. So the government can alter politically, if it wants to, prices of individual things. So if, for example, fuel goes up, we might think, well, that's a good thing because we want to discourage people using fossil fuels. So what we'll do is we'll give higher wages to public sector workers or we will subsidize other aspects of prices like food, for example. So there's lots of ways of dealing with inflation in the ways we've said. And we're also recognizing that inflation comes and it goes, it's transitory. And as Warren once said, all of the inflation in his lifetimes come from energy prices. And obviously, prices have gone up. Governments have felt they've had to raise their prices in order to protect the economy, prevent bankruptcies and all these other things. So we've got to think out of the box. We've got to prepare to say, yeah, inflation's bad, but there are things that are worse, like was giving a furlough the right decision so people could stay at home, even if it had caused a bit of inflation, which I don't think it particularly did. But yeah, they still do it anyway, because people matter more than inflation. So I also advocate for, for the people that are going to struggle most in inflation, which is those that are on fixed incomes. You know, so we need a decent pension system. We need to obviously ensure that people are protected from the effects of inflation. And given that the government is the currency issue, it can do all those things. And at the end of the day, as we say, this idea that our constraints as a nation are financial, when, as Patricia said right at the beginning of the show, they're real. If we've got the political will, we've got the real resources, we have the technology, we can deliver what we want, decent living standards for people, a decent environment, etc. So we've got to be thinking along these lines, trying to be positive. And it is difficult when politics is moving in the wrong direction. They're getting George Osborne out again, dusting him down, and we've got the most right-wing Labour Party in my memory. And these things can be, but there are people doing things that are good. You know, there are lots of pressure groups out there. The Gins are doing a great job. You're doing a great job. So there's lots to be positive. Obviously, you've just got to keep on message, keeping friendly, humorous, but just telling the truth relentlessly. And I guess if we're going to deal with our own inflation problems, I, I, that's quite tricky. I suppose we have to start maybe trying to spend more time enjoying our gardens <laughs> and less time driving into town. So I guess that's all I can recommend. And more time walking the dogs, if you've got them, and less time flying around the world, maybe. But I'll just leave that. I'm not trying to, you know, I did a bit of traveling when I was younger, but on that note, I'll probably leave my rant and advice and hand over to you guys. Patricia, you know, at the risk of like starting a whole new podcast episode, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> One thing we haven't talked about that people might be thinking, why are they not talking about that? Is that people are starting to say, well, people have been saying for a long time, but more and more people, I would say, are starting to question has Brexit had something to do with this? You know, the constraints that have brought about inflation and i know that you've got thoughts about that and that your phd work is in the inflation arena so you know i, I wonder what you thought about that well i think the narrative on brexit and inflation if correct me if i'm wrong because i haven't looked at it in detail what they're saying now they're saying that brexit has contributed to inflation I think it said it's had an impact on the exchange rate and that's made it more expensive to import and that carries over to inflation. That's what I've read. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing. But I think a lot of people are saying, well, look, you know, the, a lot of the workers that we lost 
because of Brexit, if they were in the workforce now, then things would be different. Well, hypotheticals is it's a difficult one because things would be different, what, within a Tory government with the same kind of austerity mentality. And if Jeremy Corbyn had won, things would be very different. <laughs> and <laughs> okay, it's right. difficult to sort of understand how different that might be. Keir Stammer, I don't think they'll be that different, but they'll be different. <laughs> and I think that the extent to which we have power to shape our own economy completely trumps any kind of short-term effect on trade that Brexit may have caused. It's arguably turning into a long-term effect. Yeah, well, long-term if you don't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it can be, a, a, you know, long-term forever <laughs> if you don't do anything about it. But that's the issue. And I think that, to me, I insist Brexit, to me, was a political question, not an economic one, because I knew that we're a wealthy nation. We're one of the wealthiest nations in the world. If anybody can do things, you know, can shape their own destinies is the likes of us. And so I knew that and I wasn't afraid that we might have a government that understood that power and had the interests of people at heart and, and actually shaped things for the better. We're perfectly capable of doing that. So to me, the question was political. It was about how do we make sure that we have a government that actually responds to the needs of the public? We haven't spoken about this for a while, but to me, the question of it's not just about, oh, what's best to do economically, as if we're looking at it, as if we we're just scientists or optimizing systems, you know, engineers of, of a system. And I guess we've been discussing about what the right thing to do in inflation is. But the point is that in order for to have a government that actually you know, there's a, a million ways to deal with inflation, but to have a government that deals with inflation in a way that's in the interest of the majority requires better means of accountability. And so to me, everything has to start with accountability has to be the priority. You cannot have a, a prosperous economy that actually cares about the many if that government isn't accountable to those people. So the Brexit question was an issue of accountability. And of course, there are no guarantees in terms of frameworks of time in which I can tell you, oh, by then we'll be much better. It depends. The problems that we have could go on forever for as long as we have a bad government. But it's about now we have channels of accountability to exploit. So I feel that maybe the left hasn't quite gotten to grips with these opportunities. And I was really upset about the way that it was framed, you know, any talk about Brexit being seen as an opportunity was immediately shut down. There are no positives to this. But actually, the left particularly cannot really afford not to look for these opportunities wherever it can. Okay, our political landscape is going to change substantially in Brexit. It's not just about whether we have trade or not. It's about the whole political balance between the players, the key players is, is changing. So how can we use that to forward our own agenda. What does that give us opportunities to do? And I feel that we've sort of refused to even look at that. Yeah, not trying to put you on the spot, but the channels of accountability that opened up, I mean, can you sort of give me an example? Well, the EU was always a means of sort of blaming someone else. And the government always tries to blame someone else, but the EU gave them a perfect example. It was so very often back in the day. Now you would get these letters from the EU. Obviously, they had no kind of real power to make us do austerity, but they would send letters every now and again saying, oh, your debt is too high or your spending is too high. Please move it more in line with the rules that we agreed, even though we have no means of forcing you to do that. Please do that. And to people like Osborne, and even those in the media who are interested in austerity, they would highlight these things as justification. They would highlight these things as saying, Gordon Brown is spending too much. Look what the EU is saying about our spending. And the EU having the authority to do that was a problem because of these things. It divided accountability between two parties, parties meaning the EU level and the national government level. And it made it really hard to pin down who was causing the problem. And if you blamed one party, if you blamed the national government, they would blame the EU. If you blamed the EU, they would blame the national government. And it just became a game of who's in charge here. And at least now the government has no one to blame. There is no one else other than them. And there's, as you said, that we could 
spend talking about this for hours about the different layers of complexity Sorry, I, I probably shouldn't have brought it up right at the end <laughs> <laughs> no but that's in a nutshell that's about it mm -hmm. okay so before we go phil tell us what you've got coming up in terms of events and papers or anything else all being well next week i'm going to present a paper on a chapter that i was invited to write in a, a post keynesian book now that's quite a thing to have shall we say a minor mmt are like me invited to contribute to a post keynesian book so obviously i don't want to get carried away but maybe this is a sign of at least some level of rapprochement or whatever we're talking about brexit i've probably pronounced it word long but maybe a bit more where some post keynesians at least you know are beginning to appreciate mmt a bit and it's worth debating although they won't necessarily agree with everything we say, maybe the differences don't make valuable discussion like an impossible thing. So that's quite good. I, I'm presenting that, and I hope at the conference to you know make some links with other heterodox economists, particularly ones who might be interested in the environment, things like that. So maybe trying to. So I'm very interested in the green issues and whether MMTs can forge some sort of links to people who are open to the idea of sovereign money, but haven't brought it up front and centre. So that's one thing. And, of course, the big one that everyone's excited about is, you know, the great man is coming to town, not Santa Claus, but Warren. <laughs> and all being well, you'll be in London on September the 1st at the Discus Theatre. So, you know, we're hoping to have a Gims event. We don't know the exact format of that, but, Hopefully, you know, yourself will be there if you're about and Patricia and... Yeah, I, I think I could squeeze it in. We'll get Warren presenting on something. So the format of the event is yet to be confirmed, but as far as I know, the great man's coming. That's a great place to leave it. We've been speaking to Dr. Phil Armstrong, author of Can Heterodox Economics Make a Difference? and co-author of MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. And I'll link to where you can get hold of both of those in the show notes for this episode. I'll also link to where you can apply for our friend Dr. Dirk Ensers. MMT and European macroeconomics course at Maastricht University because the application deadline for that is the 1st of July. So don't miss that. Equally urgent, the application deadline for the MMT summer school in Poznan, Poland is on the 30th of June. So I'll link to where you can find out more about that and to where you can find out more about the European MMT conference, which takes place in Berlin on the 9th and 10th of September. That will feature L. Randall Ray, Nathan Tankus, Dirk Entz, Jan Leng, Stephen Hale and Warren Mosler and more for our uk listeners as phil just said there's going to be an event in london on the 1st of september featuring mmt founder warren mosler tickets aren't on sale yet and details are to be confirmed and so i'll link to where you can sign up to the gims mailing list for updates about that and finally for our patreon subscribers there'll be a link to a new patron only episode with dr sam levy about economics in the movies along with many other patron only episodes including the edited audio highlights of the book launch of mmt key insights leading thinkers check out the show notes for all of the above but for now thanks so much for joining us once again today on the mmt podcast dr phil armstrong great to be with you as always That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.